So hello, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Good morning, everyone, wherever you are in the world. My name is uh, Robeson Taj Frazier. Uh, I'm an associate professor in the Annenberg School for Communication. Uh, and I'm very, very excited and delighted to have you all with us today uh, for a phenomenal conversation about an incredible work of art. Uh, I'm also the director of the Institute for Diversity of Empowerment in Annenberg, which is a collective of people who are really committed to um, exploring the role that media and the arts play in helping to shape and reshape our understandings of difference, of struggles for equity, of community storytelling. Um, so it's you know phenomenal that idea can also be a part of, of this event. We're extremely excited uh, to celebrate uh, this work. It's yours, a story of hip hop and the internet directed by you know, one of our own Annenberg alum, Marguerite de Beauguin. Uh, uh, you know, a good friend of mine, but a brilliant filmmaker who, you know, began working on this film while she was a, a graduate student in the Annenberg School. So she has joined us. She has made the film available to all of you. Uh, let me ask this, how many of you guys have seen the film? Can you either raise your hand or push the icon to raise your hand? And if you're my student, you know, and you haven't raised your hand, my expectation is that next time I see you, you have, your hand will be raised. Um, fantastic, I'm happy seeing all these hands raised. So the film is available right now via Vimeo. The link has been shared. If you did not receive that, um, we'll be sending out another email with information in terms of how you can view the film. It'll be up and available on Vimeo through Sunday. But Marguerite is here with us to discuss the film. And we are also extremely fortunate um, to be joined by Rostrum Records founder and president, Benji Grinberg, who's also featured in the film and plays a really kind of prominent role in helping to shape the arc of the story in the film. So we're great, we're excited to have the two of them with us. We're gonna spend our time today uh, talking a little bit about the film, maybe for about 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And then we wanted to open up uh, for a Q and A conversation with all of you about the film, themes that stood out to you, issues in relation to creative culture and the entertainment world that stand out to you, really to kind of uh, fa facilitate, you know, some fellowship and exchange uh, about this work. Uh, so with that, I'm going to give it to Jim, uh, who's helping us out on the admin side. And Jim, can you play the, 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 the clip, the, the trailer of the film? Hip hop in the early 2000s seemed to have conquered the world. But the doors were still locked, and the music industry held the keys. Until now. The labels have always kind of been a step behind in technological advancement. It's completely controlled by the ebb and flow of the consumer. It went from in and out CDs to trying to get your records posted on a block. Hip hop has always been ahead of the curve, early adapters on technology. Everybody that I ever met in rap history was through the internet. We've been around, it's just that the world caught up to the web. You don't need a label right now to get started. The gatekeepers are not really the gatekeepers anymore. You know, the digital world, it's, it's just different. You know, the kids, everything is just different. It sucks when you don't have a place like this to come to, because I would come and find out about stuff here that I didn't know about. The younger generation are using computers and downloading music. You know, for people who experience the physical life and the digital, it's like the physical is way better. A little bit of the soul of hip hop is being taken away. I think Wiz Khalifa is a genius. He did it without radio for a really long time. And over that time, he built his base. We were dying to get off of Warner Brothers. I don't think they got Wiz at the time. We were just better off apart. years ago I just been heavy on the internet so I just molded my career by being a fan and seeing what I wanted. We're pioneering how the new era of rap artists operate. Taylor Black gang or yellow, die. We look to a label to blow us up 
I think the next generation is going to see more. Of I want to be like Lil B. He's kind of self-made internet star. Cooking is just a blessing. Lift, lift, blow, scoop, cooking. Hip hop has always been a viral culture, just like the internet. If it's good, people will find it. You have artists who are getting creative, but don't feel married to the message. It's more about the music. I'm the mixing engineer of Odd Future. I mix Goblin. I DJ the live shows. Aside from that, I just swag shit out. But you read in the media what makes the headlines is not the art. The visuals and the imagery is all super important. There were music videos, skits, four or five mixtapes at the time. All it was was keeping it simple and realizing that a lot of kids are, are like you. So let's make stuff to relate to them and let's make stuff that we want to hear. Our entertainment world is being shaped as much by decisions made in teenagers' bedrooms as by decisions made in corporate boardrooms. I control what I do. I can do anything as long as I got the fans. Whose world is this? It's mine, it's mine, it's mine. Whose world is this? It's mine, it's mine, it's mine. Whose world is this? It's mine, it's mine, it's mine. Whose world is this? Thanks, Jim. So, Marguerite, I guess to kind of start, can you tell us, like, give us, I guess, a summary, like, what's the film about uh, and what led you to want to tell this story? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, so the film is about the rapport between hip hop and, and the Internet and how uh, the hip hop artists have always been at the forefront when it comes to technology and how it helped change the music industry. And what I wanted to say is I was an alum, uh, Annenberg alum, and so I was very much influenced by that one year I spent at USC Annenberg studying online communities. And I noticed that hip hop was probably like one of the biggest communities online. Um, and I was looking at uh, people like uh, Soldier Boy and MC Hammer who had his own website. And um, I was just very intrigued. And um, so that, that's what gave me the idea to work on that, on, that, on that subject matter. And what I also wanted to add is the trailer that you just saw was actually the first thing I actually produced that was related to the film. It was my, um, um, my passport. That's how I was able to start accessing people and, and eventually uh, um, ed edit a first version of the film and so forth. And so a lot of the ideas that were later developed in the film are in the trailer. So normally the trailer is what you do after the film, but in my case, uh, the trailer was the first thing that we did. Oops. I said, fantastic. Can you tell us a bit more about like the process of, of making the film? I mean, like you said, so creating a trailer initially, but then kind of going out and identifying, like how did you, how did you determine who you wanted to to, to, to highlight um, and what stories you wanted to tell, especially with so much change happening amid, I'm sure the process of making the film. Sure, so there was several things that happened. So when I started um, looking into hip hop online, I also launched in parallel uh, a YouTube channel and a blog called LA Stereo with the help of uh, DJ Val the Vandal. And then later other people came on board like Rebecca Heathcote. Um, and I, sorry, I was, uh, so that's how I was approaching artists. And at the time there weren't any like Pitchfork Media or The Fader, they were not doing online videos. It, there were other people doing it, it's like Hard Knock TV. But we, so we came in and we were LA Stereo TV and, and we started interviewing artists and it was fun. And so, but pretty quickly, that's when I was like, oh, so maybe I should uh, do a film. Actually, uh, uh, J. Kevin Swain, who, who did uh, uh, years ago a screening at USC Annenberg uh, of Soul Train was the person who gave me the idea. It was like, oh, this is dope what you're doing. You know, you should do a film. And um, 
And little did I know that, you know, that was going to be like the enterprise of my life for the next 10 years or so. Um, and, um, and, and so also how, what determined who's in the film and who's not, it's a, it's a balance between access because access in documentary is very important. And that's also, again, to uh, Wiz Khalifa's tribute, for example, he, he gave us access, you know, Benji gave us access. So they, you know, they were very open like that. Um, and I think it, it kind of mirrored well, you know, their own approach, how they were with the, the audience and everything. So it's, it's partly access and partly me kind of figuring out, um, you know, who's the most interesting, who are the most interesting people. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, do, do you want me to carry on, on on why I chose the specific people or? Um, well, I do want you to actually tell us that, but I actually, before we get to even talking about specific people, can you give us a bit of, so making a film is an extremely ambitious kind of endeavor. It's not for the faint of heart. Did you have background as a filmmaker? And then as well, like, what was your background or your relationship to hip hop prior to like really putting yourself out there and reaching out to artists and then going into the process of building relationships with artists and documenting, you know, all these transformations in the culture? Sure. So actually, I had more of a background in in filmmaking, as in um, pretty much since I started working, I've always done film related stuff. I you know I worked in in the UK um, for a Discovery, and I've always had a production background. So that's actually my my main trade is production, and and actually documentary. Um, the the not so obvious part is hip hop. I've always loved hip hop. It's always kind of been a fantasy of mine to do something about hip hop, but the real hip hop head is, is my brother. I'm not a hip hop head. And I think for me, that's the fun part is not, is, is, is I was not a hip hop head and, and then being able to discover so much. And I always say the anecdote and people are shocked. Like, I didn't know who um, Pete Rock was, but he was playing a boombox. So I'm like Googling him and you know, what I've probably found his Wikipedia page. So I was like, dope. So now I know who he is. And then I'm going to go and film him and, and film him like DJing and stuff. So that's also been how I approached it. And obviously when I tell pe people, a lot of the people I met kind of assumed I was a hip hop head because I, that's who I was also hanging with. Like the people um, who helped me also, as well access uh, artists and everything are all real hip hop heads. I'm just not that person. But I love, obviously I love the culture. As you say with a common, B and Kanye West, exactly. you know, poster next to you. Um, well, my knowledge has, has grown. Very much so. It's funny for, to me to hear you say you're not a hip hop head in terms of how many people and artists and executives and graphic designers and people you put me on to, but, but it's interesting to hear you say that. Jim, can you play the next clip for us? Because I think that'll be a good feed or two in terms of talking about some of the people who you feature in the film. Cushion Orange Juice was his eighth mixtape became a major event on the internet, taking it by storm, and Wiz, with his grassroots marketing tactics, changed how artists use social media to promote their music. Yeah, Cushion right? Orange Juice is just as popular as any album that's out there right now. We've got Super Stoked on it. This you know, is high. We go. We go. to mesmerize when he comes on stage. There's no m marketing behind that. Which is sort of why the major labels are having to change their role a bit because we, we don't need you anymore to get the music out to people. So Benji, I actually wanted to use that as a kind of good segue to, to, to your experience and obviously your role in the film, but even more so your experience um, within the industry. Can you talk a bit about that time period, uh, you know, in your career and Wiz's career and what, what was kind of groundbreaking about what you all were doing um, in terms of artist development, in terms of uh, uh, really kind of bypassing some of the conventions of how you break an artist and how you build audiences um, in, the, in the music biz. 
Sure. Well, um, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, I think in order to give it a little bit of context, you know, in just a few sentences is that I, you know, after college, I ended up working at Arista Records, which at the time was a very big major, major label. In 2003, I left Arista to start Rostrum as an independent hip hop label. And I met Wiz in late 2004 and signed him in early 2005. And so, and the time frame that's really in this film is more so 2010-ish um, going into 2011. And so um, there's five years there, you know, where between, you know, first signing him, you know, as, as really a, a high school student in Pittsburgh, um, where I'm also from, um, to building up to the point that we got to when Marguerite and team, you know, sort of met up with us and, and, and started talking to us. And as an independent label, particularly then, you know, we didn't have large bud budgets, you know, we had to get really creative in how we could reach people um, because we couldn't throw money at it because we didn't have any money. Um, and so it was really a, a, a factor of, of necessity um, that led us to embrace the tools um, that were becoming available at the time, whether it's Ustream or MySpace or eventually Twitter or, you know, all of those things to try to reach people. And, you know, a lot, a lot of, a lot of it was Wiz's genius himself. You know, as much as I'd like to take credit for everything, it's, it, it's not, it's, it's, you had an artist in Wiz that understood um, that letting people in and um, showing them what everyday life is or, or what it's like to record a song or, you know, all these different things that led them to become fans, not just because of his music, but because of him as a person. And, um, and, uh, and that's what really separated him from other people and what led us as a company in conjunction with him to develop a lot of these innovative marketing tools, if you will, and, and ways of doing things to reach people because we couldn't just, you know, throw money at things. We had to just get innovative with it. And so that's really how, how the whole thing developed. We were also, oh, sorry, we were also coming from Pittsburgh. So, you know, it's not like we were living in LA or in New York and could catch up with the scene and, you know, whatever. It was like, we were coming from Pittsburgh. So we had to get creative with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things that I really appreciate um, about the film is that the time it gives to highlighting just how you all were like early adopters of a lot of different platforms. And it seemed like we're experimenting in terms of like the utility of them and, and to some degree using them in ways maybe that the even creators of those platforms might have not initially attended, intended. Um, and I'm just yeah. wondering to about, I mean, both about that, but also too, in terms of some of what you guys were doing in terms of even how you were planning your tours and what cities you were going, I mean, and the role that data was playing in that process. Yeah. Um, well, I wouldn't go so far as to say we were using data um, cause that sounds much more sophisticated than what it actually was, um, particularly at the time. But it was really the utilization of, of these new technologies um, in sort of a cross platform way. And that's kind of, you know, fancy speak for saying Wiz was gonna go on Ustream and he said, well, I'm gonna tweet that I'm going on Ustream and, and post the link, you know what I mean? Which today doesn't sound that, crazy but back then it was extremely innovative to like say hey audience over here come over here and you'll be able to watch me right now record a song and um and it was just really you know um just intelligent ways of, of using those technologies so it wasn't just the embrace you know uh, embracing of them it was you know just even getting creative in how to use them together and and different things to show but early on i thought it was important you know, I saw all these um, alternative and rock bands, you know, from the outset, right as they're starting, starting to tour. And no one in hip hop was doing that. You know, you, you would really, for a hip hop artist to tour, 
you know, you really had to have like a song going on radio and, you know, a lot of different things happening. But I was looking at these other bands and they're just getting in the van and going around to the cities around where they lived and, and, and building up audiences. And so I thought that, why don't we do that with, why don't we do that here? You know what I mean? Um, and, uh, and so that was a key part alongside of releasing a lot of free music was really just getting out on the road before most people would have um, and building a fan base. And also, you know, one of the side effects of that is that it, it helped turn Wiz into an incredible performer because he was used to, you know, rocking a, a, a coffee shop in front of 10 people you know, um, and making the best of it. And then, you know, a club of, you know, 35 people and then, you know, and it keep growing. But by doing those experiences, you know, um, and having those experiences, I should say, and developing your chops, you know, kind of was, I think, part of how he became such a force on stage. Um, and, uh, and so it's just all those things coming together that really created this, you know, this incredible period of time. Yeah. The other thing I just wanted to ask you about too is, you know, one of the ways I was introduced to Wiz um, as an artist was, you know, I mean, this is before, you know, Black and Yellow and just the wave that, I mean, that, you know, that became a global, I mean, yeah. not, I mean, and as well, the Steelers winning. I mean, I just remember that period, but I, but I was introduced to Wiz Khalifa through his mixtapes. Like there was just yeah. a period of time where like the way to get a, get a, you know, a bubble or some, or, or the way to kind of capture people's attention wasn't like, like you said, through radio or, or a major album, but through having a buzz through mixtapes. And I'm just wondering if you can, you can talk about that period as well. You too, Marguerite, because I know that's something you really highlight in the film, like the importance of mixtapes. And when mixtapes went from just being like, you know, I grew up in an age where a mixtape was like, you know, you made a mixtape for somebody, you know, like you sat there and you recorded a mixtape for somebody or, Whereas this is a time period where artists are releasing mixtapes and it's not just in barbershops or, you know, uh, 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 on the street, but this is a time period where like, there's a whole kind of uh, a community of a mixtape culture online um, and that you kind of have to be in the know about in terms of being a part of. So if you guys can talk about the mixtape, uh, the importance of mixtapes, especially um, during that time period of 2008, probably to 2010, 11. Or even beyond. Well, I think, yeah, if I, I'll just, if Margaret, if you don't mind, I'll just jump in and finish kind of what I'm saying and then, and then transition to you. Um, I think, look, mixtapes had been around. We didn't invent mixtapes, you know what I mean? But they were very much in the physical format, um, literally selling out of the back of the car, you know, um, in corner shops, stuff like that. Um, you know, and you could do your research on DJ drama and, and, you know, and all that stuff. I think that um, the, I think that where Wiz and also Mac, uh, Mac Miller in particular helped to lead the way and, and other artists during that, during that time was previously mixtapes a lot of times were using in industry instrumentals. So, you know, songs that other people recorded, you would take the beat from those and, and, and do a new performance over top of that beat essentially. Um, and what was happening now that um, now that mixtapes were becoming available online, et cetera, um, is that artists started treating them like like albums, essentially. Um, and it wasn't just, you know, let me take this 50 cent beat and 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 rap over it, you know, doing something different. It, it, it started that way. And some of the early Wiz mixtapes, you know, like Grow Season were based off of industry instrumentals. But um, it, uh, you know, the art form was, was, um, was taken to a new level and, and the mixtapes actually became real albums that were called mixtapes in part because they were just released for free online on like Dat Piff and, and other mixtape sites, you know, it went from, you could release a single song release, I use release in quotes, but you could release it on, on MySpace, right? Like on your profile, you could have like a song playing and it was sort of a, a kind of a way of, of, of releasing a song. But then, you know, with the admin of Dat Piff and other sites, you could actually ha uh, house these whole projects. Um, and it, uh, and I think treating it as an album and treating it as a real project. I mean, that's how you get Christian Orange Juice. That's how you get kids. That's how you get these sort of seminal mixtapes from that period um, is from kind of putting a new importance on them. 
Yeah, I definitely want to say that. I think that's the thing I was maybe the most interested by is the, is the mixtape, is the, the concept of free music. And I think that's really uh, pretty unique to hip hop, even though obviously other people have done it as well. And um, I think that was the most, for me, probably the most innovative part. And also that reflects back today because now music is, is nearly free, you know, because you can stream it everywhere. And in a way, hip hop anticipated that. And actually they, I, I kind of show in the film, they even anticipated it before you had a whole new generation that really uh, went on board with it. You see a Tech 9 in 2003 who gave out his album for free, knowing that if people liked it, they would pay for it. You have also a Chuck D in, in, in 99 or 2000, he was also um, putting uh, music online, but he also um, commented on that when I asked him, he said, but no one was quite there yet. So you know you already had artists who were thinking like that and uh and i think that was the the, the genius of it and and i think today people understand better the, the the concept of giving away you know music for free and everything that you can get back in in exchange um so so that that to me was extremely interesting and then uh, just to jump off what uh, benji said earlier about live you know live touring that clearly uh that's something where wiz really um wiz and his team really kind of laid the groundwork as well for other artists. And, and for me, when you ask me like, how, how, you know, who did I choose, you know, to be in the film or whatever, um, I know that we would go and see, we filmed a lot of lives. Like I have a lot of live footage of concerts. And, um, and I would really uh, judge an artist based on his um, live presence. Um, and, uh, and Wiz clearly was magnetic uh, when we saw him. But same thing, I remember like a, a Kendrick, Kendrick Lamar, like first time I saw him was like nearly his first show, but they'd been practicing a lot uh, before, you know, they actually, you know, uh, became more official. And uh, he was great on stage as well. And so uh, I, I feel like that, that really became an, that was really also an important component of what made the artist. And I definitely paid attention to that as well. You know, one of my favorite parts of the film is you know, the kind of footage that you're that you're able to capture. I mean, you feel like in certain shots that you're with the crowd or that you're right there on stage. It doesn't you know, there's a certain kind of a, a rawness to um, the footage that I that that gives me that feeling of being at a hip hop show. Um, and I'm wondering, in terms of especially in terms of the, the people who are, are are whose voices kind of help to tell the the, the story um, and the narrative within the film. You know, obviously there's Wiz, Lil B, Odd Future, but one of the people I think who stands out especially is Sid, um, who's an engineer from initially with Odd Future, but later establishes a, a really now, you know, Grammy nominated band, The Internet. And so I'm wondering too, I mean, oftentimes when we think about hip hop, not always, but people might think it's primarily a space of men, but you also highlight, you know, a woman who's cultivating a voice and space for herself within, within um, you know, hip hop culture. And I wonder if you can just talk about that too, about, about her role, her presence within the documentary, and also like the fact that you're there capturing, you know, really the kind of creation of this collective, um, both Odd Future and the internet, you know, who now, you know, they've, I mean, goodness, they've been in the industry near 10 years, but you're really there at the, the start of them entering into um, their own identities as artists and how that evolves, as well as kind of how they don't feel limited or constrained by some of the rules of the industry. And like, why, why is that, I guess, an important part of the story that you're, that, that you're kind of focusing and highlighting in the, in the film? So I was already working on the film before I found out about Art Future. And when I found out about Art Future, pretty much same time as everybody else. I mean, I'd heard, I'd heard a little bit about them. Like I, I remember receiving like a text from, Jasmine saying, hey, these kids hang out with Casey Veggies or whatever, but, um, but they really blew into the, you know, the media consciousness. And, uh, and I was just mesmerized because I felt like they were doing what I was uh, kind of looking for, what I was trying to talk about in my film. I felt that they really encapsulated it. Um, and, uh, and I think they, they, they do, because I think they've, they've shown, you know, they, they've shown that, um, that they had longevity and, and they've, um, created a lot of very innovative deals and, um, and keeping their independence. So that was extremely interesting. And the thing is, um, they were also very, you know, I was talked about access early on. They were also very peculiar. Like I actually did tweet 
at Tyler, the creator. And so the only time he ever responded to me was like, yeah, no, like, no, thank you. Cause LA stereo was probably like a little too corny for him. And he was already like blowing up. So I couldn't really get hold of Tyler, the creator, but I was obviously very interested by Art Future. And it was just kind of luck that I met Sid, um, you know, at the time that I met her and everything. And then um, Sid is obviously a very charismatic person, but when you see her, you don't, you, you don't know, like you, it's, she's, she really grew into the, the artist that she, that she is now. Um, so I was fortunate that, but I was already interested by her, obviously, because she was a woman, she was the sound engineer and she played a crucial role um, that hopefully I, I do kind of highlight because she, she really was able to give the, the band like, uh, like the whole collective, like a, a coherent sound or a place for them to, to be in. And, um, and but, I, but when I did film uh, the, the scenes where they're in their room and they kind of become the internet under my eyes, got a bit of a, a play on, on, on my work in a way, um, I was very interested because I could tell that there was way more uh, there that, you know, that the, the, the kind of, um, how do you say, meet, meet, the, meet the eyes at first or whatever. And I, I could see like her, her drive and, and that she, she obviously was very like multi-talented, but, I, but you still, you couldn't really foresee um, where she went with that. But I do think she's interesting because again, she's not like an obvious, star and that's not what she's trying to be either she's a musician and i think a lot of people can relate to that you know that really that kind of pure love for art and really wanting to be an artist and just wanting to be about your art um and not being uh and, and not wanting to be constrained by it and um and so i think her evolution for that is interesting how she's able to not compromise and just stick to what she likes and discover herself in the process My other question had to do with, um, you know, one of the things the film highlights and is is the both the creative and economic tensions that exist between artists, um, musicians, and record labels. Uh, I know Benji too. That's something that you speak about within the film and why you all decided to go a particular route um, with Wiz's career. And I'm wondering if both of you can both talk about both talk about that tension that exists um, and as well situate that too in terms of like the kind of some of the current state and current dynamics of, of creative culture in the music business today. Like, you know, now we're living in an age where it's, you know, it's more, I think, presume it to be more prevalent that artists are considering and thinking, you know, have to think critically about, about you know, um, data and, 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 and utilizing various kinds of you know, um, digital platforms. And I'm wondering, like, you know, was this a prevalent aspect of these discussions, you know, back in 2009 in the industry, among the artists you were working with? You know, what were the artists, were the art, like you said, how were the artists ahead of the curve? What are the struggles, I guess, of today um, that it's important for artists to be critically engaged and thoughtful about um, relating to these kinds of tensions between both me an artist working within the music business and as well the role of the, the internet plays in in the circulation of, of 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 work and art i think look so back then in in like 2010 you still you know at that point you know um like rostrum as a label was like two or three people so we didn't even think of ourselves as you know like we were a label but we were we felt like and you know an extension of you know of Wiz really like, you know, that like, we are here to support what Wiz wanted to do, this, that, and the other. Um, and so when we talked about the label, we are talking about Warner Brothers or Atlantic or, or whoever. Um, and, um, and so, you know, but still back then, in order to, to properly release something, right? Like, you know, you didn't need a label to put something up on Dat Piff, um, but, you needed at least a label like Rostrum that had a distribution deal um, in order to get your music up on iTunes, you know, and those sorts of places. You couldn't just directly upload to iTunes the way that you can now directly upload to SoundCloud, you know, um, or the other DSPs. There was no TuneCore. There was nothing like that, right? So you still, you know, even when we are independent, you know, as a label, 
our label functionality was still important because we could still sell records if we wanted to, you know, outside of like the free, you know, sort of free platform. Um, and of course we were a label and we were with this label, but we really viewed everyone else as, you know, the, as like the, you know, the big labels, we were, you know, we were kind of the, the renegades or I don't even know if that's the right term, but we were like kind of the rebellious ones. And so our message then, and, and what's in the movie is, you know, Hey, Hey label, Hey, major labels, like, you know, things are changing and, you know, now we don't need, major labels to actually start reaching fans because the tools had changed. Um, and that was what the really exciting thing was, was that we could have, you could have a label like Rostrum with, with far fewer resources, but still develop, help someone like Wiz develop an audience the way that, that, that he did. And it was clear that at that point, the labels, you know, had to, the major labels had to start adjusting, you know, what their sort of, uh, uh, power structure was, you know, so that they could keep up with the times. Now, of course, as streaming became prevalent and stuff like that, they bought up all the early playlists and this, that, and the other to sort of maintain a new stranglehold on what it became, you know, today. Um, but what we see in this film is really like the early days of artists getting, you know, kind of control of their own careers and being able to reach people by themselves. Um, and of course, over the last 10 years, it's only, you know, gotten um, better and better in that regard, you know, where not only can you reach fans, but you can self-distribute, you can do all sorts of different types of things, um, you know, really by yourself, you know, or, you know, with a strong team around you, which I still su suggest. And um, I think also what drew me to making this film is, is just as a creative person kind of wanting to kickstart my own career, um, you know, taking influence from a lot of what these artists are doing. Um, and, and, and I do believe that's also one of the reasons I wanted to make this film is you can use hip hop as an example, but you can apply it to whatever uh, craft you have, uh, because I think it is important to use the internet to show your work and everything. Um, I remember at the, at the time, the discussion, obviously there wasn't a discussion around data, but it was interesting that artists was able to start, um, to be able to start identifying the audience, you know, the, um, the, there were discussions as well about the sound, how the sound was changing and how it wasn't local anymore. And, and um, so, so it was the same with the fans, like you had also uh, more fans from uh, all over. And that was interesting. Uh, clearly the, the discussion with data has changed today. Um, I'd, I'd definitely be interested in knowing what uh, Benji thinks about it. I feel like for me, um, now the when I started the film, it was all about the big music industry and and the 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 under the the underlying climate was more like they're, they're the baddies and it was that wasn't my point, but it was a little bit like that to the point where it's always a bit hard to get people from labels to talk to you because they know that you're gonna frame them as the bad guys when really that's not what it's about. But I think that even that has changed today. I think now like artists need to see how they position themselves in, in relation to all these like platforms um, that, that, that are not using all that data and that data that, uh, other, that all these artists are generating. So clearly I feel like today, like Benji said, artists um, are more and more able to communicate with their fans, but there's a, something else that's happening is uh, we, we can see you know the power of all these big big platforms and everything and in in that they're also using that same data and they're kind of like you know playing around with it the way they want to in a way that you don't really have as you don't really have control on it uh, as much as you used to so i think there's a new tension for me um, that i see that's kind of happening that's different from when i started the film where the tension was more like the independence like Benji and then the, the big majors. But I may be wrong, but that's how I see it. Maxine, I see you posted a question in the chat and it's lovely to see you. Can you, would you, it would, I can ask the question or would it be great to hear your voice. Can you ask that question? All right. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to ask about the impact you think that you know, you're talking about um, having the power to distribute yourself and um, kind of putting yourself out there as an independent, like individual artist. Um, you know, how has that had an impact on artists advocating for their beliefs, uh, you know, 
politically and for their identities and things like that. You know, we've seen huge um, movement this past summer with um, the murder of George Floyd. So there's just all of this energy that's being kicked up around that. And I wonder how the shift in the industry would change the way that people are able to um, react to that. Thanks. Nice to see you too, Taj. <laughs> um. Um, so just to make sure I have it right, because I'm reading the, the, so it says, what kind of impact do you think independence and self-distribution has had an impact on artists advocating for their beliefs, identities politically? Um, you know, from my standpoint, look, music and art in general is always, you know, no matter what distribution looks like, is always a way for people to express, you know, their beliefs. And at least in my mind is always welcome. But what you're right about is that you know, in order to get that out, let's say in the 60s, you know, when there was lots of protest music and, and things going on relating to, you know, to Vietnam and to civil rights and other things is that, you know, even then you, you, you definitely needed a record label because you had to get into an expensive studio, you had to manufacture records and CD, you know, well not CDs, you know, albums at that time. I mean, it was a lot of money. And so you kind of had to have the stamp of, somebody you know uh, some entity to to really get it to the masses today you know i think that you know anyone with an internet connection a computer you know a microphone can can make something and record something and get it out and so you definitely see you know a lot of self-expression sort of across the board um and you don't need anyone to sort of say yes this is a sort of acceptably you know uh you know an acceptable belief to, you know, to have. And I think it goes though for, to the further sort of fragmentation of, of popular culture, um, which is to say that, you know, there's, there's lots of different, not just genres, but a billion subgenres, um, a lot of different points of view, you know, um, and uh, a lot of different beliefs and everyone, you know, being able to express themselves has has formed sort of this environment where there's lots of of um, of pockets, you know, of popularity. Where, um, you know, back ten years ago, if someone was popular, like everyone kind of knew who they were, right? Um, and today, um, with how it is, there might be an artist with like a hundred million plays on Spotify, and me, who this is my job. Have, haven't you know I haven't even heard of them um, and because there's all these different lanes and um, and it all kind of plays into it to each other so you know of course the you know democratization of, of, of you know distribution and everything like that has absolutely been helpful for everyone you know no mat not even just politically or you know point of view wise, but also genreized to help like find their own audience and to express themselves that way. So I would add to that, one of the things that is also interesting in terms of hip hop is not just the artists, is obviously the, the community. There's a really strong uh, community feel. Um, and, the, and I think the community is also or the communities are the ones who um, I feel were the first ones to, 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 to start being more uh, political and everything and the artists kind of followed. And I say that because I remember uh, Ferguson was all over my Twitter timeline and it was just crazy. And I say that because Ferguson is in the film and I go there and then luckily I meet some rap artists who uh, like Tef Pose from St. Louis and, and who was really instrumental in, in helping um, get that, that protest out. But the, the, the people who really did you know, the protest were the people from Ferguson, the people who were relaying um, the protest were the people on Twitter. And they're all part of all these communities that, you know, that Benji is also talking about. And, um, and I, from my point of view, I think gradually you could see the artists, the hip hop artists, uh, slowly change their their perception, slowly be be more vocal about certain things. Because um, when I started to look at these artists, it was a complete new generation for me, and I was like, "Where's the where's the politics?" Because I, you know, I like again, I, I hadn't really followed hip hop in the last few years, and I was still stuck with like Chuck D and everything. 
but it wasn't that it was like big Sean talking about his, you know, his kicks. It was, uh, it was, uh, it was a, it was just a different generation. Some of them had skinny jeans and it was more an emphasis on lifestyle, but I feel like, of course, the emphasis on lifestyle is still there, but you, you do, you have seen a lot of these artists, you know, gradually just become more mature and, 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 but not just the artists. That was my point is also the audience, the community, because that's also what we're talking about. It really is, uh, you know, a community. And I think, um, it's uh, and and everyone plays a role, and that includes uh, you know the fans and everything. We have a question here. I'm going to save this question. This is a good one to kind of close with. But uh, Michelle, are are you there with us? I mean, I can read your question, or it'd be great to hear your voice too if you, if your microphone works. Are you there, Michelle? Um. Yeah. Hi. I'm sorry. Hi. I don't. I don't have my. I'm not able to use my video right now, but um, yeah, I can ask the question. Let me find, sorry. Huh. Okay. Michelle has an awesome group of filmmakers that she's uh... Yeah, hi. hi. Um, I'm glad that I could join you guys tonight. Um, congrats. So I was just, this is a question as independent artists, what tools or technology exists now that excite you? What do you think the next 10 years will look like for independent artists? I mean, I say Benji's the expert. <laughs> um, I assume you mean independent uh, recording artists? Um, um, yeah, or just, I guess, like, that's, you know, specifically m more so, like, your lens. But I meant in general, like, even as filmmakers or, right. you know, artists in general. Right, because that's how I read it was possibly Marguerite re relating to you as an, in, you know, independent artist, you know, filmmaker. Um, I think that, you know, for for recording artists, um, I think that, you know, the tools to reach people just get more and more plentiful. Um, I think the downside to it is that you're expected as a recording artist to utilize all of these tools these days. Um, with such re regularity that you know it, it's quite invasive if that's not your natural way of doing things so so some artists are very naturally always online or always on TikTok or always on instagram sharing all the time that's just like part of their dna but a, but a lot of artists i would say the majority of artists that doesn't come naturally to them even if they are sort of you know uh, of the age group where all this stuff is very native to them um because, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, um, you know, not, I don't know, if you enjoy your private life, you know what I mean, which, which a lot of artists do, just because you're a recording artist, or you're an actor, or you're, you know, whatever you are, doesn't necessarily mean that you're trying to give your whole, you know, uh, every day of your life to the sort of to the public eye, but that's what's kind of expected. Um, and so I think that it's, you know, it's a balance that, that, you know, you have to you have to sort of strike with with these sorts of things, but the tools are there. And what's you know more and more exciting is that there are there are a lot of options for artists, right? There there are certain artists where a label like Rostrum is perfect for. You know, there are certain artists that a major label you know is perfect for, and there are certain artists that that really should just be releasing their own music. And and the the um the ability for all of those things to sort of coexist peacefully is, is great, you know? Um, I think that some of the technologies we'll see moving forward are gonna help with, um, with payments happening, you know, better um, with, uh, uh, you know, um, because right now it's like, you know, you get, you get streams on Spotify. Spotify has to sort of take a month or two to collect those. Those then get paid out to, you know, your distributor. Your distributor then takes a month or two to then pay it to the label. The, you know, so there's this big delay sort of from, from when an action happens to when an artist is paid for it. Um, and part of it is databasing. Part of it is just like, you know, old forms of, of payment and stuff like that. So I think that um, once the music industry kind of gets their act together in terms of having a central database with all, you know, songs and artists and writers, et cetera, having very good data there, 
um, you're going to see that whole thing like really get faster. And I think that that's really, you know, important. Um, it's even slower with, with music publishing, you know, and so um, it really takes a while from something, you know, when a song blows up, for instance, you know, the artist isn't seeing money, at least from the record side, um, you know, for six, six to 12 months, you know, at the earliest. Um, and so to me, as a, even as a label, like that's, you know, that's unacceptable. Like I, you know, I want the whole thing to be sped up. Um, so that, that, you know, technology, you know, whether it's with blockchain or, or other things that are going to help speed that up, um, that's exciting. You know, virtual concerts are exciting, which obviously got a huge boost during, you know, quarantine, et cetera. There's a lot of different things that are going to help people, you know, maintain connection. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, that's sort of my, my viewpoint on it. I mean, I think uh, creativity is endless. And I think that's what those artists have showed is just how creative they are. So, you know, now we, we are starting to talk a little bit about blockchain and NFTs and things like that. And you already see um, different artists going and uh, venturing in those worlds. And, and, and now you have like new poster ch childs like Travis Scott, you know, with, with all his deals and everything. And, uh, and I think, you know, in terms of creativity and, and cre creative ways of connecting with fans, it, you, that that's always gonna, going to carry on and um and i guess today the name of the game is is streaming i i don't know how that's going to change but um but otherwise in in terms of inspiration i think it, you know we you, you do i you do have to stick to your trade and 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 know um how to how to do things and, and be good at it uh but but you, you still have to you know pay attention to to these platforms and and this and and make that decision how you want to or not want to uh inter interact with them and um and and take advantage of them uh our next question is from joanna joanna can you we can read your question but it's nice to hear voices too yeah i can ask my question um I guess my question is kind of some observations you might have made with um, hip hop and its influence on K-pop and also K-pop's global growth. I love that um, in your documentary, you talk about how Wiz Khalifa really reached his fans through Ustream and connected with them personally. And so it made me think about my own interaction with K-pop and how um, K-pop artists use VLive. Um, now more artists are on Clubhouse. Um, they're just finding different ways to basically be available to the fans. And so I was just wondering any observations you have made on this culture of hip hop and how it has influenced K-pop um, and its industry. I've definitely wondered about that because um, even though hip hop is, is the most uh, listened music to in the world, I think K-pop just took over in terms of, I guess, online presence. And uh, I don't know enough about the music genre in itself, but I definitely see K-pop as a as a kind of follow up to what hip hop is doing. And then you know they they kind of took on board a lot of things that you find in hip hop, including some of the aesthetic, and um, you know and, and become their own power genre. And uh, and you, and you see that even this summer it was it was wonderful to see like the K-pop fans coming to the to the rescue. Um, you know, with the, the, the Black Lives Matter hashtags and things like that and, and really uh, taking over the Internet. So I, I think uh, what K-pop is doing is, is extremely interesting and is definitely in the uh, following in the lane of what hip hop ha has been doing. And I probably more so uh, uh, than any other genre. Yeah, I'm not I'm not the biggest um, uh, I'm not the most knowledgeable about K-pop, so I don't, I'm not, you know, an, an expert, but from, from what I have seen and from what I've watched, I think, you know, like Marguerite said, a lot of the aesthetic, whether it's the dancing or the clothing or, you know, how they're doing things, a lot of it is taken from hip hop culture or at least influenced by hip hop culture. And now, you know, what, what these companies are doing, like Big Hit, et cetera, you know, they're they're kind of taking the intimate approach that social media has, et cetera, and they're um, they're making it glossier and and sort of you know uh, making more sort of like high priced you know little mini documentaries or or you know giving you a peek into each artist within the group because usually there's a whole bunch of artists within a K-pop group. Um, 
to kind of let you in on what it is, but it's very highly, um, um, I don't know what the word is, it's very highly like monitored and, and curated, you know, whereas like with hip hop, it's not like anyone's curating what the artist is saying online. They're going to say whatever they're going to say. And for K-pop, I think it's very, you know, they're very much under the control, if you will, of, of the companies and managers that they, that they work with. And so I think that's, that's, they're trying to emulate it, but there's like a very strong curation happening with it. No, I think great question, Joanna. And I think uh, the relationship between black musics and, uh, and, and K-pop and music in South Korea and beyond music, I mean, just like the visual culture of it too. I mean, whether it be the influence of a, 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 you know, a video director like Hype Williams and how you can see his aesthetic approaches to video being kind of replicated in K-pop. And somebody like Teddy Riley, who's really had a, you know, I think it might be Teddy Riley's third or fourth life um, in terms of how prominent and important he's been as a producer um, within the K-pop market and how many musicians, artists, producers from the US who actually are currently producing for K-pop artists right now because of kind of Teddy Riley and various other people who are serving as, as liaison. My colleague, uh, Heijian Lee, who I think is also on this call, is someone, Joanna, I would recommend you reach out to to talk a little bit more about that because they are paying close attention to these transnational um, cultural connections as well as in you know connections in terms of industry. I wanna move to the next question, Jody, if you will. We, uh, turn your mic on, Jody. There you go. All right, I'm on. Yep, you're on. All right, man, I, th I, I, I thought you were gonna make a joke about Teddy Riley having Zoom in, or like Instagram live issues with the with the baby face battle. That's besides the point. Um, my question is about sort of how, well, in the era of the film and also towards now, sort of how quote unquote leak culture has sort of proliferated and become a thing and taken different iterations, like around the sort of like that, you know, that's like the, I regard it as the blog era for back, lack of a better term. There's a big community around mixtapes, but also when the album was about to come out, like invariably a week in advance, you know, it would leak on some Zippy Share, Media Fire link. Like I'm, I think if I remember correctly, like ONFIC probably leaked early among other albums, you know, a myriad of them. So that was like a thing. There was a community, you know, for that. But then I feel like as streaming emerged, it sort of died down. But now you're sort of at the point where people are sort of leaking and putting out these songs and it's shooting down releases. They're sort of halting sample clearances. I know Playboy Cardi had a lot of problems with that. There's whole like YouTube channels of like, you know, NBA young boy that's getting tens of millions of streams, but he's not seeing any of that because it's not, you know, attributed to him and so forth. But yeah, I was just wondering about y'all takes on that. Am I muted? Oh no. Okay. So, um, um, so yeah, leaks, at least to me, were a much, much bigger deal back around the time that we're taught, you know, like in 2010, et cetera. Um, in part, because when you had an official, official release, you know, back then physical product was, was, was really important. Um, so, you know, if you have an album like Rolling Papers, Wiz, which is Wiz's first album, um, when we joined for forces with it, Atlantic Records, you know, they need to send that to the plant months in advance, you know, um, to manufacture and whatever. And then it, and then it needs to ship to stores. Um, and the stores normally got it, you know, uh, um, a number of days before it was actually released. And so any point along that production line, somebody can just grab it and, you know, and throw it up online. And so it was a, it was a much, much bigger problem, at least to me back then, because, you know, you had all these other people touching the music. It's obviously still an issue, but it's a lot easier, you know, these days to monitor it and take it down. Um, there's companies that are set up specifically to take it down across, you know, YouTube and other other sites. You know, if a if a leak does happen, um, and we don't send it out, you know, usually um, far in advance to anybody, you know, and you know, so as long as everyone on the team holds it tight, you know, it's not that big of a deal. But um, but yeah, you know. Um, I don't know. Look, there's always issues with sample clearance. There's always things that as a label, you can't claim, you know, if it, if it drops on YouTube, 
because a fan wants to drop it and it was something that didn't end up getting cleared. Um, it's nothing that a label can monetize and therefore it's nothing that like Cardi would be able to monetize, you know? Um, and so at that, at that point, it's a decision of like, well, is, you know, are we going to take it down? You know, like what's the point of taking it down? At least people are still enjoying Cardi music and it remind you know, it, maybe it leads them to other things that you actually have up for streaming or, or sale or whatever. Um, so to me, I wouldn't necessarily fight to take that kind of stuff down, but there's plenty of, of stuff out there that cannot be monetized for various reasons and are out there. And it's not like, oh, you know, the artist isn't making any money. No one's making any money off of it. You know what I mean? Except the sites that are hosting it, you know, who can maybe, you know, do some advertising or whatever. And so, you know, it's, it's not like the labels making anything and not sharing it with the artist or whatever. It just kind of goes into into nowhere you know um and so but i don't know i i saw it me personally it was a much bigger issue for us back then yeah i mean i don't have a lot to say except that i i reach i i remember taking some notes like um leak is a marketing verb in, in one of the um things i was reading and so i remember like retweeting that and retweeting that um, and I think it also addresses more in general, like the issues of copyright and the issues of copyright on the internet and, um, and how like uh, now platforms like YouTube are really going uh, hard on, on copyright issues uh, sometimes to the detriment of creators. Uh, so I, I, I'm more, uh, I, I think the discussion for me is more around like uh, copyright and, and, and issues about being able to remix and not remix and, and things like that. And, and platforms are not making it, they're making it less and less easy. Well, because they're being and and because they're starting to be held more and more responsible for what's on their networks. Yeah, uh, okay. you know, and so they, you know, there are certain rules that are starting to change that where they can't sort of hide behind the like, well, we, you know, we're not responsible for what people post on it. It's like, well, yeah, you are, and so it's starting to change, and they're definitely getting a lot stricter about it. Um, but as Marguerite said, it's to the detriment of of certain types of artists that that you know use you know, maybe use sampling or other things, you know, to express themselves. It's, you know, those sorts of things can get taken down very quickly, unfortunately. But then it also, um, you know, gives more um, constraints. So I think that's why like a collective like Art Future, they started, uh, you know, making their own uh, sound beats. And that's also why artists starting making their own beats because they didn't, you know, the, this, the whole clearing thing is so tedious that, um, that it, it kind of influenced that as well. So it is, that's also, I guess, how creativity works is when you put barriers and things like that, then it, it stimulates it. And we, you know, we, we clear, you know, all, all the songs we release, we, we clear our samples. Um, and, you know, I'll tell you, I mean, it, it delays a song from coming out for a very long time, you know, uh, um, potentially months. And at the very least, it's going to cost you eight to $12,000 to clear a sample, you know, between the publisher advances, between the advances to whoever the, the master, master copyright holder is, um, lawyers fees, et cetera. It, it very easily gets into that range. We're clearing a sample right now, which was, you know, it's like $9,000 on the master side um, and, you know, something like three or four on the publishing side, but then there's also, you know, so it's, it easily gets up to $15,000. And, you know, while that may be something that a company like Rostrum can do, an independent artist, you know, can't afford that, you know, and that's, and, and so, you know, trying to figure out other ways that that can go down, you know, um, other ways, you know, there's sort of these standards now where it's like, they just quote, you know, and here we need $6,000 for this or $4,000 for that, you know, ways, you know, so that more independent artists and artists that can't initially afford that up front can still sample, but you know, maybe it's a bigger back end or or whatever it is, so that everyone stays invested, but that artist who can't necessarily afford that can still, you know, make music in that way. And so, you know, I don't know. Jim, can you play that last clip for us? Scratching the record just for the, the best part, just for the break. Some samplers, samplings, when we just started sampling a piece of the song, so we didn't have to grab the break anymore, we could just make a machine do it. All of that says to me, you give somebody talent, did nothing, and they can make something out of it. <laughs> Now 
technology is very, very important because if you don't change with the times, the times are going to pass you by. You know what? My arm's a little tired. I think you should come DJ for the rest of the show. You gonna put me on the spot in front of Grand Wizard Theodore? Come on, man. Pop folks were the first to really see the true potential of digital music and digital sampling and sequencing and computers. We were the first. Hip hop. It's been hand in hand with technology since day one. And I think that's why it's so close to how people are using technology right now to sell the music. So that's one of my favorite sequences in the film. Like I remember when you showed me that footage because I was with you the day before and you were like, look what you missed, look what you missed. And I, and I saw, so I'm just wondering if you can explain to uh, uh, you know, the attendees, some folks might not know why that's an incredible sequence of events um, and how that ties into, you know, some of the main themes that the film highlights um, and especially some of the main themes that also, you know, Too Short um, and Be Real are describing the relationship between what they're describing and what's happening in that sequence. Because I think in many ways that kind of is a good way too of responding to the question I saw that Violet has asked in the chat about is it about the music industry? Is it about the change brought about the internet? Like, you know, really, what is that? What is it at the heart of this film, and how is that kind of showcased in some of that sequence? So, first of all, shout out to Taj and his mother because um, Taj grew up in New York and and uh, and uh, and helped me on the film um, uh, while I was still working on it. So, uh, so it, it's thanks thanks to Taj and his mother that I was able to find the connect and go to the Bronx and and be like, wow, this is the best day ever. I'm on stage with Raki, Melly Mel, Cool Herc, um, Grandmaster Kaz, and they're all like super approachable. And it was like, you know, it was a block party. It was not a block party. It was a party at the Bro in the Bronx and in, in the park and everything. And it was just amazing uh, to 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 be on stage with them. Uh, and, um, and I think that the point I was trying to make is, is that uh, hip hop is a, is, is an, a technological music and, and therefore we should look to hip hop to also, uh, figure out different ways of using technology because, uh, by definition, that's what hip hop has been doing. And it's not just on the music side, you know, it's also on the social media side. Like it really is technology uh, as a whole. And so uh, that really is the, the premise and the, and the heart uh, of the film. And, uh, and, and Rakim kind of and addresses it. He's, he, I mean, it's, it's probably not easy to understand like out of context, but he's talking to, oh yeah, Grand Wizard Theodore, who is- uh, what, what, Wizard Theodore is. You know? Yeah, can, well, can you say, because you're gonna say it better than me. I don't wanna, I don't wanna say- so All of us are probably accustomed to like people who, DJs and who scratch a record and basically, who, you know, the DJ using the record like it's a percussive instrument where they're kind of talking and scratching. <laughs> Grand Wizard Theodore like created that. Before, before Grand Wizard Theodore in the late 1970s, people just, you know, was about playing a record and finding the break and going back and forth between the main part that dancers like to dance to, which is usually a drum break. Grand Wizard Theodore revolutionized how to turn the turntable into an instrument by itself that you can make, make sounds. Um, you know, alongside of people rapping. So it's pretty unique that you have Grand Wizard Theodore there who revolutionized how to turn a turntable into an instrument. Um, but as well, Rakim, who, you know, I knew as, a, as the God MC, who's scratching, <laughs> they're going back and forth. So it showcases that like, he is not just an MC, but he also knows how to be a turntablist kind of musician, um, which I thought was just fabulous to see, especially, um, you know, with the community. You know, he wasn't in a studio, you're with the community. And that's exactly it. I think it's also the love. You can clearly tell, you know, the love that all these artists have for, for the culture and, and how they're, they're, they're fans as well. But he's lit, that's also literally what he's saying on stage. He's saying, thank you, Grand Wizard Theodore. I wouldn't be here for you. And that's also what's beautiful with this whole like uh, journey of hip hop and technology is everyone is all these contributions and it's how it's created this, this masterful genre also that, that's, uh, you know, helped a lot of people. And so, um, and so, uh, and and so, I think this dynamic that I I show, you know, later in the two thousand, you know, the ten years ago, and everything that that dynamic always existed, 
And then, and then it kind of um, asks the bigger question, like when you think about technology, what do you think about? You know, who are the people who are making all these technological tools? Why are we not giving more space to uh, all these people who clearly, uh, you know, uh, have a, a, you know brilliant ideas about technology? Why are we not giving them their flowers? Why, you know, why, um, et, et cetera. So I, that's also uh, kind of the underlying theme of the film. And, and to, re to respond to Violette's question, who, who is my cousin. Hi, Violette. Um, I think um, technology, uh, the, the platforms embedded themselves in the, in the conversation with the music industry. It started with Steve Jobs, Napster, Steve Jobs, who then you know, created the iTunes store. And now today you have, you know, plat you have a lot of platforms. You have Spotify, um, et cetera, et cetera, to the point where it's, you know, it's, it's not just about the, the music uh, labels anymore. There's not, you know, the music industry now, if, I guess, if, if you want to be correct about it, it's not just the, the, the record companies. It is also the tech companies, even though, again, they're kind of like hiding a little bit, saying, no, we're not, we're just like neutral. But, but you know, clearly they, they have a very invested interest in music because music is a very social um, uh, activity. And, and now, you know, the web is, has become extremely social and music is really how you can uh, share um, your interests with other people and connect and everything. So the platforms have a lot of in invested interest in music and, and I would say also in hip hop because it has become, uh, you know, the dominant genre today uh, in, in uh, worldwide. I think, you know, uh, not, to, not to bring it down at all, but I think that one of the, one of the, tr tragedies or travesties of of this though is that someone like Theodore or some of the early pioneers of hip-hop you know uh never uh, you know for the most part never really made much money off of it yet they created this this you know this this whole space that that generations later you know artists labels streaming you know sites everybody is 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 making a lot of money off of um and then you have these pioneers who haven't and 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 juxtapose that with you know the person that's you know that started spotify or the person that developed a certain technology you know uh they've been able to monetize that they've been able to you know to to uh have ownership on it and all these early pioneers, it, it, it pains me a lot of times when I think about them because a lot of them were really left behind economically. Um, and uh, I think it was one of the like real injustices uh, uh, of, you know, of kind of, you know, and it's not anyone in hip hop's fault. You know what I mean? It's just one of those things, like a lot of times early adapters, early people who, you know, I'm sorry, early adopters, people who who like create this sort of culture aren't the ones that are then able to to really um, capitalize off of it. It's it's people much further down the line. This has been fantastic. Uh, I appreciate both of you for your time. I wanted to close with a question I saw that was a little bit earlier about, uh, you know, what are you currently working on, or what's next? What, should, what are there things we should be on the lookout for? So me, um, unfortunately, I'm still working on the same thing. <laughs> I'm still working on this film. I'm, uh, I'm re-editing it, uh, which is great. I'm extremely happy about it, by the way. Um, I'm re-editing it for TV, uh, for Arte, so it's a um, French, Franco-German uh, network. And I'm super excited because, uh, uh, because I think it's, it's a good way to, to finish the project, I guess. But I, I have a feeling it's never really gonna be finished because it's, it's such, a rich, um, such a rich topic that uh, I still draw a lot of inspiration from it. Um, for me, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, in, in sort of the, the constant state of making new music and, and working with new artists and, and all of that. And so, Rostrum as a label continues on 18 years into it. And, uh, you know, um, we're still, you know, a fully independent uh, hip hop label that's, you know, doing our thing. And, and, uh, um, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, for us, it's just continuing to release music and supporting artists and, and uh, you know, trying to get their music heard by as many people as possible. Incredible. 
thank you both for you know your work and for your time today and your willingness to you know respond to questions and talk about this film again i would encourage everyone who hasn't yet please watch this film it'll be up and streaming um for free until sunday um but as well we'd also encourage you to you know tell your friends and family members about it and, and post about it too um because all the conversation about it is you know obviously beneficial in terms of circulating the word about the film uh we thank you jim and Jasmine, I want to thank you too for assisting us on the production side of this event and thank all of you for taking some time out of your day to be with us. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, you so much, everybody. Uh, thank you, Taj. Of course, of course. Thank you, yes. Benji. Yeah, thank, yeah, you. thank you guys thank for having you. me. Everyone. everyone be safe, be safe, take care. All right. <laughs>